Hi Church family, our service will be starting in about five minutes, so I encourage you to please join us in the auditorium for our worship service. And just note that our street cafe and as well as the Sonka Cafe will be closed, so please make your way inside. Our service will be starting in two minutes. If you are outside, please join us inside the auditorium. And if you are inside the auditorium, I encourage you to just prepare your heart uh, as we get ready for our worship service today.
notes, it says to give a warm welcome. And I wish that my words could actually just heat up this room to give you a physically warm welcome. Um, that was a joke. Um, that aside, thank you so much for joining us here this morning. It's such a privilege to be here. And I want to say it's so special to see the intentionality that you are showing. That in the midst of a chaotic and busy week, you have decided to come to church that you've decided to stop and to gather in a place to enjoy fellowship, uh, to sing praises to God, um, to study his word together. That is so special. So thank you so much for joining us here to, this morning. And I just want to say in the busyness of the world that we find ourselves in, if you find yourself here weary this morning and need of rest, if you find yourself mourning and in need of comfort, if you find yourself have failed and in need of strength, then this church opens wide her doors with a, fr a friendly welcome from Jesus, the friend of sinners. So welcome today, church family. Um, as we get into our service, I just want to remind us of who God is, his promises, his truths, um, by reading 1 Hebrews verses 1 to 3. So if you wouldn't mind, open your Bibles with me or tap open to uh, chapter 1 in Hebrews verses 1 to 3. I'm reading from the ESV, and it says, Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his sons, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He, in the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Amen. And so last week in the sermon, we reflected on how some of the disciples saw a vision of Jesus transfigured um, and how they literally saw the radiance of his glory. Could you imagine how incredible that must have been to see Jesus and to believe? And this morning, I am expectant that we can have a similar experience we don't need to travel to Israel, travel to that mountain to experience that. No, through the Holy Spirit, um, we can have God's light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. That's what we can expect today. And so my prayer for myself, my prayer for you, and something that we can be praying for one another is throughout our service, as we sing together, as we pray, as we study God's word, that we might come to a deeper understanding of who God is, that we might trust in the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. Now, church, we, just to um, have an opportunity to find out what's happening in the life of our church. So I'm going to, um, yeah, cue the, uh, the tech team to play the video. But before they do that, an announcement that I would just like to include in this uh, video is that we have done our new members process. We have interviewed these members, and now their names are up on the website. And so we encourage you, church family, to go and see these names, um, to pray through them, and if there's any concerns, to let us know. But what a big praise point, it's 46 people that we are welcoming into membership in our church. So praise God and cue that video. Sanwanani, one of our values at RUC Kids is partnership with parents. We want to support and encourage parents as they disciple their children. And one way we seek to partner with you parents is through our Connect Cards. Now this is a short weekly resource that summarizes what your children have learned on a Sunday and helps you to engage with this as a family through the week. And so we send these out via WhatsApp channel on a Monday and flyers will be available at the exchange with the QR code during collection time. And so we really encourage you um, parents to grow in discipleship with us. And speaking of family, we have our 
annual family gathering coming up and yes it is the AGM and this is basically a time for us to meet as a church family and get to celebrate and reflect on God's goodness and faithful um, faithfulness throughout this past year and so we ask you church to join us on the 24th of April right here um, for this gathering. So as we go into this time of worship, I just pray that you let go of any distractions, that you truly worship God in spirit and in truth, and that you really get to set your focus on the things that are above. Enjoy the service. Good morning church, good morning church family. We are so excited to worship with you this morning. This first song speaks about how wonderful, how powerful, how awesome our God is. So please, please stand and let's sing together.
The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never, never late, late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yeah. church we truly serve a living God that he will never fail us and he'll never leave us or forsake us those are the promises that we can hold to and when we say such things what can we know if God is for us who can be against us so worship, it really doesn't stop here. It continues after the service as we enjoy fellowship with, an, well, not with one another. But it also doesn't stop with singing. We have an opportunity now to give up our tithes and offerings. And the reason why we do it in the middle of a worship service is we believe that offering, it's an act of worship. It's a declaration in our trust in our trust of God who provides. It is a gratitude and a thanksgiving to God who provides. And so in the light of that, I'd like to ask our service team to come forward to help us with the offering. And while that's happening, I'd like to call up Christine Kleinhaus. Most of you know, know her. She was our youth ministry associate with Dave Mayberg up until the, the 5th of March, 2022, when Christine left to Japan to be a missionary. So welcome, Christine. It's so good to have you. <laughs> so good to have you. I'll 
turn it on for you. Um, so while this mic is turning on, Christine, can you give us an update on the last two years? What's been happening in your life? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Good morning, church. So lovely to be here. Uh, for the last two years, I've been at what we call JLCC, Japanese Language and Culture School. So um, I've got a few pictures to show you, and I'll very quickly go through everything. So first of all, studying Japanese and culture has been my main priority. Um, I did a lot, of, a lot of that, still doing. I'm not nearly fluent, but I'm doing my best. And I've also met some really amazing teachers. I've been able to even meet their um, kids and their daughters. That's uh, Shiratori Sensei and her daughter Kana-san. Really amazing teachers. She even taught me Japanese while it was still in lockdown from South Africa. So uh, that's us having lunch together. And um, I also had a ton of cultural observation where you basically go out and experience different things in Japan. Like I went to a temple, went to a snow festival, and um, I think there's another picture of snow festival. A lot of snow. There's six months of the year there's snow. It, it's very cold. <laughs> and um, I, had, I got to see other cultural things as well. Just experiencing life in Japan and seeing what life is like. I uh, also had some amazing, oh, that's another cultural observation that I did, went to a um, museum, a, uh, yeah. Warrior? No, never mind. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so uh, so uh, many cultural observations, a lot of dancing, a lot of samurai, uh, samurai, that was the word, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, also, uh, so I have little notes here, forgive me. I. Able to, I was able to build relationships with the people within NOMF as well. Some of the single girls, uh, that's Roz, she's, um, she's my best friend in Sapporo. Uh, also, there was a bunch of single girls, a lot of single girls coming to Japan studying Japanese. And I was able to sort of, we all got together, I asked them to share their life story with me, a tip that I learned from Rosebank, thank you to share your life story and they share their life story. And so we built a really strong connection, all of our single girls feeling sort of isolated. And now we're this like amazing team and I love those girls a lot. Uh, all moving to different places in Japan, but while we're in language school, we built a really strong friendship. I was also placed in different churches while I was at Japan. And when I mean church, it's like that is the church. Sure. <laughs> so that's one of the branches we had. We, uh, so I get to go to different churches and just sort of see what life is like in those churches. Not doing ministry necessarily, just observing and learning from people, building relationships. After that, uh, well, also during my time, I had a Japanese language partner, Ri Watanabe. She's amazing. She has a lot of patience with me and a very compassionate listener. So we also do a lot of different things so together. She took me to concerts and she shows me all sorts of things. We go to the park and we pet all the dogs. Oh, <laughs> so we spend a lot of time together. Whenever I can, we meet up. And then I have some Japanese friends as well. I've built some friendships along the way outside of OMF in the church. And that's uh, Tomo and Chukuka. And with Tomo, um, uh, he is a Japanese guy and him and his wife, uh, Chio, they plan a flea market four times a year, and I've gotten involved with planning. I do all the English part of it, all the volunteers, I manage the volunteers, I help with the communication, setting up things, and I've been able to build relationships with them because their vision is to bring Japanese people and international people together. So it's very in line with what I want to do, I guess, in a way. Absolutely. <laughs> so it's been really amazing just building these relationships, getting to know Japanese people, and practicing my Japanese. And then also, apart from the flea market, I've been able to build relationships with other international people and Japanese people. I've been invited to weddings um, and also going on hikes with friends, just trying to connect the world with Japan and also hopefully sharing my testimony with a lot of these people. My Japanese friends have been asking about, you know, why I'm a Christian, what makes the Bible true, you know, what makes me believe in what I believe. So all those things have been able to happen through these relationships and it's just been a blessing. It's been a roller coaster, but it's been amazing. Thank so you. So good. Thank you, Christine. And maybe you can just explain your beautiful outfit. Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> 
わかりました。<笑> so this was made by Murasaki San. She's one of my Japanese friends that I made、uh, at a flea market, and she actually made this for me. So it's a fusion between kimono on this side and Western design on this side. So of course I had to wear it for this special day. <laughs> and thank you for doing that.、Um, so Christine, you've shared、like、such a wonderful, quick highlight of what's been happening in Japan.、Um, a big question that I'm going to ask you to summarize pretty shortly: What are the big needs in Japan? Why did you decide to go there? And then now that you've finished. Her, so Christine's finished her language study, and to give it a little bit of an insight into her life, kanji. So it's the characters of the Japanese language. There's like thousands, over five hundred thousand. Over five hundred thousand characters that she has to learn, everyone. And she's been doing that for the past two years. And so we're so grateful that you're here. But and now that you're stepping into ministry, what are you doing、um, in these next、okay. couple of years? Sure, I only know about a thousand five hundred unique kanji so far. That's so incredible. That's I barely know English. I, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> But、um, so. Now that I'm done with my language studies, I will go and intern at a local church, and it's about the same size, about maybe a few people more, about 20 people, and I'll spend two years with the church under Japanese leadership, and it will only be Japanese. There'll be no more English at all, and、uh, I'll learn to do ministry within the Japanese in the Japanese way, I guess.、Um, I'll start ministry as well three months after. I'll start in May, and then three months after, I'll officially start ministry. So I have three months to see what they do within the church, and、uh, then we will have a community.、Uh, uh, um, my English eludes me. Sorry. We will have a meeting, <laughs> and we will discuss what ministry I would like to get involved in, what the church can offer. So even though it's not necessarily in line with what I want to do, it's teaching me how to do ministry and how to be sensitive, how to read the air, and and how to serve the community even within the limitations that we have in Sapporo. I want to disciple people. I still have a heart for discipleship. I want to help new Christians, new Japanese Christians who've gone abroad, coming back to Japan. Suddenly, they don't fit into their own culture anymore. I want to help them. I want to learn the why it's so difficult for them. Well, I sort of see why it's so hard for them to be a Christian in Japan. But I want to help them stay in their faith, discipling, walking a road with them, helping build a solid foundation. And help the church establish themselves.、Sure. So that's still what I want to do.、Um, hopefully, that's I can do something like that in the church that I'm in now.、Mm -hmm. But after my two years internship, I'll be、uh, I'll come home for a short home assignment, and then I'll go back for more permanent placement.、Mm -hmm. So what people can do is they can first of all I need all the prayer I can get. <laughs> Uh, so definitely praying for me. That's at the top of my list.、Uh, secondly, if you want to encourage me, if you want to send me encouraging messages, I send out newsletters. Definitely not every month. I'm sorry. <laughs> I send them out as,、uh, of generally one,、uh, once every season or once every other month. It all depends on my workload and how busy life gets. But when I do send out update letters. People respond and they encourage me because it does get tough there sometimes. I miss、yes. the community here tremendously. So getting people to interact with me or connect with me through my newsletters is really helpful. And then of course I need financial support. I cannot go unless I'm sent. So people coming behind me and sending me off that's really helpful. I am fully supported at the moment, but after two years everything sort of resets and I have to raise my support again. So. Staying in the field really depends on everybody here. So if you want to connect in any one of those ways, I will be out in the street, and you can come and meet with me at the table. Hi, thank you, Christine. Thank you so much. Church, will you、um, pray with me as we pray for Christine? All right, close your eyes, everyone. We just thank you, Lord, for this moment that we can gather together with our sister Christine. Lord, we trust and we know that you are a good father. That you、um, are a God of love and mercy, and we lift up our praise to you. You are worthy, and we are so grateful for you, Father.、Um, and so we long for a day where every nation and people group praise your name. That the gospel may be preached to every person. That you will send laborers like Christine,、um, so that people that don't believe will come hear your gospel. 
Add to your church daily, Lord, in Japan, and use Christine in that, Father. Um, bring your sons and daughters from afar, from the rising of the sun to the setting of the sun. Let your name be great amongst the nations, Lord. And so we thank you, Father, that you have brought Christine to Japan, to a group of people that are in desperate need of you, Father, to a church and a community that wants to go out and to witness to people. And so we pray, Lord, that you will strengthen her, that you in your might and grace and will will give her everything that she needs, Lord. We know we can ask this of you, Father, because you are present in her life, that you are a God that desires friendship and relationship. And so we know, Father, that yeah, Christine can come to you and we can come to you to ask, Lord, that you protect her, Father, um, that you sustain her in ministry, that you keep her from any danger or illness, Lord. We just thank you, Father, that we've had this time and this moment to meet with her. Um, Lord, and we just, we continue to pray that as she faces trials, that your joy will be her strength, that you will, um, Lord, just be light that shines within her. She goes back to a space that has spiritual darkness, Lord. We ask that your light just shines through her and lifts the darkness as she shares your love, as she serves people, as she shares your gospel, Lord. Um, and so we know that it is by grace that you have sent uh, Christine, that you've allowed her to learn those 1,500 kanji characters, that you continue to guide her as she makes friends outside of the church, Lord, um, and that you, Lord, we trust that you will bring people into her life and that you will give her the words to say on how best to minister and to serve them, Father. We can trust this of you. Holy Spirit, our friend and comforter, we acknowledge that is your power in Christine's life, that you are empowering her beyond her natural gifts and abilities to uh, do these tasks set out before her. You are the God that has sent Christine to proclaim your good news. And so please, Lord, strengthen her. And Father, now as we turn our prayers to the message and to Pastor Richard, who's preaching. Father, I'd like to just pray this beautiful prayer to fill our minds with Christ, Lord God, as we read your word today. May we see Christ walking in the sweet shades of divine love towards poor sinners. And so as many as our faith revives and as our comfort is restored, Lord, fill our minds with Christ when our minds are empty of Christ, as in temptation and the lack of comfort, then they grind together against themselves like an empty mill. So fill our minds with Christ through your word, that we might be free from temptation and fears, that you might lead us to your promises, that we might rely on your promises, make them our own, and find their power and strength. Animate our study of your word, Lord, and that you might pour wine and oil into our bleeding wounds as we read and study more of your scriptures. And so, Lord, I just um, commit this time to you. Help remove any distractions from us as we um, listen to our scripture reading that's coming up, Father. Um, oh, how we desire that our faith might be strengthened and molded in accordance to your will today. Amen. Thank you, Christine. Please turn your attention to the screen for the scripture reading. Matthew 17, verses 14 to 27. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. 
As they were gathering in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. When they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the tax? He said, Yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first, saying, What do you think, Simon? From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? And when he said, From others, Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. So last week we were at a, at a high point in Matthew, both literally and figuratively. We looked last week at the story of the transfiguration, a scene where Jesus as the Son of God, the, the, the deity of Jesus, literally shines forth in that moment an unveiling of the glory of the eternal Son of God made visible through the face of Jesus Christ. And we heard a voice, we heard through Matthew, a voice coming out from the cloud saying, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And that was a theological high point in Matthew's gospel. Just so much of what he's been trying to do in getting us to see the divinity and glory of Jesus comes to this climax in the transfiguration. So it's a theological high point. It's also a literal high point because they do go up a very high mountain. But turns out you can't live on a high mountain forever, right? As much as Peter wanted to, remember, they did have to come down from the mountain. And so they did literally walk down the mountain, but also figuratively. So equally, figuratively, they are now, it's a, the scene that presents itself right away is a bit of a downer compared to the last scene. It's a, it's a low point in the story of the faith of people who have been exposed to the ministry of Jesus. That's a low point, literally and figuratively. The story then moves on at Jesus' second prediction of his death, and then it ends before next week, you get to the next major teaching block of Jesus with one of the strangest stories in Matthew, surely, about a fish coughing up some tax money which turns out to be a surprisingly complex and multifaceted story. So all that to say, lots to get into in these stories. So without further ado, let's go. So as Jesus and the disciples come down the mountain, they come to a crowd that has been gathered at the bottom of the mountain. In the middle of the crowd are the remainder of Jesus' disciples, nine of them, a father, of a small boy. The father runs up to Jesus and says to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he has seizures and suffers terribly, for often he falls into the fire and often into the water. I mean, I can tell you, like as a father, this is a terrible situation whose son has these uncontrollable seizures seizures and suffers because of it, and these seizures, they put him in life threatening situations. And as we learn from the rest of the story, the cause of these particular seizures in this boy's life is demonic. And so we're therefore not surprised that there's harm that is coming on his life. We've been journeying through Matthew long enough and have seen long enough that whenever demons and the powers of darkness are at work, their intention is to bring harm. So we're not surprised as shocking as it is. The good end to the story is that Jesus rebukes the demon and the boy is healed instantly. Hooray and praise to Jesus who delivers people from darkness. Amen? Now let me ask you an important question, especially if you've been journeying through Matthew for a while. You've heard of this kind of story before, right? 
This is not the first story about demonic oppression and Jesus' authority over darkness that we've had, right? It's not the first. Matthew chapter 8, two demon-possessed men living in tombs. We explored that for a little bit. Matthew chapter 9, a man possessed by a demon who became mute was delivered from his oppression. Matthew chapter 12, a blind and mute man because of demonic oppression is rescued by Jesus. So we've seen, we've seen this one before. So the question is, why another story? And why here in Matthew's gospel? Why at this point? Do we need more evidence that Jesus has unrivaled authority over the forces of darkness? Do we need more evidence? I mean, it doesn't hurt to have more, but is that Matthew's intention? I mean, really, we, we don't. We've seen, we've seen he has this authority. So why another story? Well, the difference between this particular story and the others is the focus here is not so much on Jesus as the miracle worker. In this story, the focus is on the disciples who could not work the miracle. So the focus is not so much on Jesus' ability, because we've seen that. The focus in this story is on the disciples' inability which means the lesson for us today from this story is not primarily about Jesus and his authority, although that's awesome. The primary lesson for us from this story today is about what we, as also disciples of Jesus, can do and should do through faith in Jesus. So, amen to the idea of disciples who can, who should push back the forces of demonic darkness in the world through faith in Jesus. That's where this story is going. And you can't miss the faith element here. This is Matthew's doing a lot all through his gospel on faith and a lot of it's coming together in this little story. So he first, it's in his response to the father who comes and pleads with him for help. Did you notice, I mean, that response of Jesus? I mean, it's quite, quite hectic. This is what he says, verse 17. Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring the boy here to me. Now, now this is Jesus in full prophet mode. Right, he's not less than a prophet, he's more than a prophet. This is Jesus in full prophet mode, echoing the exasperation of prophets that have come before him, who then, and Jesus now, can't believe that people still don't get it. This is Jesus in prophet mode, exasperated, but the immediate presenting question is this, who's he talking to? When he says faithless and twisted generation, who's he talking to? I'm just a reminder of the characters in the scene, Jesus, disciples, father, crowd. Who's he talking to by referring to a faithless and twisted generation? In my mind, I mean, that's not a new term, by the way. Matthew's used it, well, he's recorded Jesus using it twice before, never good. In my mind, it's a a very general term, faithless generation. So it seems to me is Jesus is acting like this situation is indicative of a larger problem. There's a larger problem going on, a problem of faithlessness and wickedness that results from faithlessness. There's a larger problem. That large problem of faithlessness and wickedness has affected the crowd and has affected the disciples to some extent too. You with me? There's a larger problem, but it's affecting the crowds and it's affecting the disciples, the problem of faithlessness. And I think it would be fair to exactly replicate that statement of Jesus to this generation. Do you think so? Do you think that's fair? Would it be fair to say, generally speaking, that this generation, the times we are living in, is also a faithless and perverse generation, generally speaking? Is that fair to say? 
There's faithlessness about Jesus and therefore moral wickedness as a result around in the air, so to speak. Yes? Yes. And does that affect disciples today? Like the larger problem back then affected disciples in the crowd, could it be that the faithlessness today could affect disciples? What do you think? Obvious, yes, for sure, we, we are susceptible to moral and spiritual values of the culture around us. And for sure, the faithlessness and perversity, that is another way of saying uh, twisted, the faithlessness and perversity around us can affect us to the point where our faith diminishes and we become more twisted. This is not just something for missionaries who live in other countries. It is for us even here now. Do you think? So we need to hear this too, this Jesus in prophet mode speaking to us. So there's a lot to talk about in these three little stories today, but let's not miss this moment. What you can't miss, what you can't miss is Jesus' exasperation here. Am I right? It's very evident Faithless, twisted, how long am I to bear with you? How long am I to put up with you? He's exasperated. It's very evident. He's not just putting on a show. It's real. Jesus expects that at some point, genuine faith kicks in, especially after all that has been revealed at this point in his ministry, all that we've seen that's the source of the exasperation. At some point, faith's got to kick in. And I know people, some people, struggle with, with seeing God as a being with emotion. And there's probably a lot to say about that. There is. But while God and Jesus, who by now we know is, is also God, while he is not, when it speaks of God's capacity for emotion, while he is not temperamental, that is unstable, moody, unpredictable, while God is not those things, and he is, of course, patient, allowing people time to repent. The point here is that while it's true he's patient, there is a point when time is up. Are you with me? Hearing the statement is a reminder to not presume upon his patience lasting forever. Actually, we could probably spend more time just really, is that a technically true statement? Because I think his patience could last forever, but time doesn't. One way or the other, the end comes, whether our own death or the second return of Christ. There's a terminus point, an end, and we do not want to be found faithless and therefore wicked when that time comes. That's the source of the exasperation. How long, how long are you gonna remain faithless? So that's Jesus in, in, in prophet mode. And then the, the story then shifts. So that just goes out to everybody listening, all those who've been affected in some way as a call to faith, but then the story shifts to a private moment between Jesus and his disciples, where the disciples ask Jesus, how come they couldn't heal the boy? How come they couldn't, they'd been trying, how come they couldn't deliver the boy from his demonic possession? And Jesus says to them, this is a, now a private moment, this is a lot more tender, says to them, because of your little faith, I suppose that's direct, still pretender, because of your little faith, your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, probably the one he just came down from, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. So again, even in this private moment, it's the subject of faith, but this time, it's not about the faithless, it is about those of little faith, which is one of Matthew's favorite adjectives, little, when it comes to faith. 
And a lot of what he's trying to do for us and disciples as we are seeing Jesus in ministry and what it's supposed to be doing to our faith. This is another moment where there's little faith. Can you think of moments previously where we've heard Jesus say those words, little faith, or oh you of little faith, as he puts it. Let me jog your memory. It does go back quite a bit. First one is Matthew chapter six. In the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus speaks about providing for us and our anxiety about physical provision. I mean, I've reminded you of this many times, but I know how much I need the reminder, so here for you again. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, tomorrow thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Chapter eight, the disciples in a boat in a storm and they're afraid for their lives. And he said to them after calming the storm, why are you afraid, O you of little faith? In fact, I think it was before he calmed the storm. Chapter 14, another boat, another storm, Peter walking on water, For a little bit, then starts to sink. Jesus reached out his hand, took hold of him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Chapter 16, again, are on the subject of provision. Oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Quick summary of the use of little faith. Can you see how stuff has to be repeated? Like two boat stories, two physical fear stories, two material provision stories. Stuff's gotta be repeated. So let me repeat what I said in chapter eight about little faith. This is what I said. What that means is it's not that the disciples have no faith. It's not that they have no, there's a difference between faithless and little faith. It's not that they have no faith. They do, they have genuine faith, but it's limited in its awareness of the power of Jesus. That was then. They have genuine faith, but it's limited in the awareness of the power of Jesus. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but just note, I I say this many times, but what this is not about, and this has to be repeated, is it's not faith in faith, right? We're We're not talking about faith in faith. I mean, faith, it's not... The idea is not faith on its own that's powerful. That's more like new agey, esoteric ideas. Like just believe and things will be okay. Believe in what? Like just that faith is powerful, but faith in in what? It is in fact belief in Jesus that's powerful. It's faith that expresses a living connection to Jesus. That's what's powerful. And on that note, some of you might be aware of In this parallel story, this one, in Mark's gospel, chapter nine, Jesus adds to the disciples, Matthew doesn't record this for a reason, but Jesus adds in Mark that this kind of demon cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. And so similarly, I I, I hear, and I've, I've said before as well, the phrase prayer is powerful, And I know what people mean when they say prayer is powerful. And I know what I meant when I've said prayer is powerful. But technically speaking, and I don't don't want to wordsmith you, I just want us to be sure of what we mean. Technically speaking, prayer is not powerful. Jesus is powerful, but his power is accessed by prayer through faith. You with me? The power is in Jesus. So it's faith in Jesus, not faith in faith, not just belief or not just muttering words, what we are drawn towards is the person of Jesus. So the disciples here, their their inability, their inability to relieve a person from darkness was either, again, limited awareness of the power of Jesus, like on the boat, just not aware of that sort of power, maybe because he wasn't present, he was like up on the mountain while they were trying to do this, Maybe it's, he's out of their minds, but I mean, he'd been there before and it didn't exactly help. So more likely, it's this idea of this, a, a lack of active connection with the power of Jesus through faith. In other words, a little bit of just trying to do it on their own, of maybe speaking words, of doing things, but not actively depending on realizing the power of Jesus through them 
in faith, which is unlimited in what it can unleash. Amen? And that's the crazy part of the story. Say to this mountain, move, and it'll be gone. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, nothing will be impossible for you. And granted, there's a lot of silliness around interpretations of this passage, especially with this beautiful, powerful picture of moving mountains and disciples mistakenly thinking that they can start landscaping businesses without any overhead costs, no need to buy earth-moving machinery. They use the power of their minds to do that. And God and, and Christ, we never see him rearranging the topography of the landscape by supernatural intervention, nor do you need a miracle. You can just get earth-moving equipment. The impossible here Nothing will be impossible, must be interpreted as nothing that Jesus has given you the authority to do and asked you to do like he had given the disciples authority over the forces of darkness. That's Matthew chapter 10. Nothing that he's given you to do will be impossible. Nothing. It's not this, this please, don't take away from this statement. This is a blank check that we can achieve anything even if it seems impossible. I can be the next Ringbok rugby captain. I can be the next South African billionaire because it seems impossible, but no, nothing's impossible for you. This is not that kind of blank check. It's also not a guarantee that you can avoid calamity in your life if you just have faith. How do I know that? Well, the very next sentence, Jesus talks about his upcoming death, which means calamity is part of the purposes of God. That's just some ways that this has been a little bit mishandled, but still, I don't want to take away from the fact that this is a precious promise that we dare not ignore. Right? In the right context, in the context of God's kingdom, much is not accomplished for the kingdom of God simply because we don't believe God will adequately empower us or we try to do it on our own strength. One of those two was, was active with the disciples. I don't know which one, both or how. But what remains for us is much, church. I just Maybe this is for somebody this morning, but much is not accomplished for the kingdom like the disciples' inability to help. Much is not accomplished because we don't believe God will adequately empower us or we undertake it in our own strength without actively depending on him. Amen? There's a lot we're being reminded about today when it comes to faith. That's where we're at. Faithlessness and little faith. And at the beginning of the year, I think it was the first, my first sermon of the year, we looked at faith and its three parts, saving faith and then living by faith, both of that in the story. The second story, the really crazy, well, surprising story, actually comes back to the idea of saving faith. That's right, the story about tax and a valuable fish has an element of saving faith to it. Let's go there. This is a unique story to Matthew. He's the, he's the only one of the gospel writers who records this little incident of the fish paying tax. Maybe it's because Matthew was a tax collector in his previous life before meeting Jesus. And so this is his industry. So he's like, oh, hey, this is a story about tax. That's, I know this kind of stuff. Let me tell the rest of the world about this particular story. However, this, this is not a story about Roman taxation. Right? So Matthew was a tax collector on behalf of Rome. That's why he wasn't like, this is not a story about Roman taxation of the people of Israel, which was Matthew's industry. This story is about the temple tax. It's a tax paid to the temple. And so it was a tax collected by members of the religious establishment and that tax was used for the upkeep of the temple, for the providing of the sacrifices that were needed in the temple. It's not the tithe, that's different. This was a once-off payment, kind of like an annual levy for the temple, if you like. So it's a distinctly Jewish tax that every male over the age of 20 had to pay every year an amount of half a shekel. So a shekel is still what you use in Israel today. But a shekel, the lower, the smaller portion, like 
rands and cents. The smaller portion is a drachma. And four drachmas equals one shekel. So half a shekel was two drachmas. That's what every male over the age of 20 had to pay to the temple. It was an amount of about two days' wages. Temple tax. So that's what's in view here. Some temple tax collectors come to Peter, not directly to Jesus. So they go to Peter and go, hey, does, your, does Jesus, does he pay this tax? To which Peter says, yes. And that's the end of that. Until Peter goes back into the house where Jesus has been and with his supernatural hearing, because we hear Matthew tells us Jesus first comes to Peter. He says, so Peter, let's talk about this thing. I mean, he wasn't even there. Uh, like he overheard the conversation, supernatural says, so Peter, and I love this, verse 25. What do you think, Simon? It's like, let's have a little chat about this. From whom do kings of the earth take toll or tax? Do they tax their sons or other people? And the obvious answer, which Peter gets right for once, he gets the right answer. I mean, really, there were only two options, right? Like 50-50, I mean, but, but he gets the right answer. And that's that kings don't tax their sons, but their subjects. If you're a member of the royal family, you don't need to pay tax. In fact, I discovered that in the UK, the queen or the monarchy never paid tax up until 1992, when Queen Elizabeth voluntarily paid tax and monarchs ever since have had to pay tax. And they're like, why did Queen Elizabeth have to do that? So that's the same because the kingdom, the idea is the kingdom belongs to the king, so they don't pay for it, it's theirs. So Peter gets the answer right. No, kings don't tax their sons. They tax their subjects. And Jesus says, then the sons are free. Then the sons are free. Now, you've got to be always in Matthew. What I find so fascinating is why this story here? I mean, this story just floats on its own. I mean, Capernaum could, be, could have happened any time. Why this story here? And notice Jesus opens it with, the tax temple thing with a story about a king and his son and he ends it with the sons are free. What has just happened on a mountain? What has been the primary revelation on the mountain? Jesus is God's son. That was a voice from heaven. This is my son. So there must be a connection in the story with something to do with son of God. And it's true. It absolutely is a connection. So this tax is specifically a temple tax. Has Jesus said anything about his relationship to the temple yet in Matthew? Well, yes, he has. In Matthew chapter 12, he said, I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And that was in a controversy about the disciples eating grain on a Sabbath day. He says, something greater than the temple is here. So the idea now, this is the idea. It's quite simple, but you have to think it through. Because the temple belongs to God, right? I mean, it's his. It's his dwelling place. Everything about the temple is in service of God. Because the temple belongs to God the Father, and Jesus is God's son, Therefore, the son Jesus does not have to pay the temple tax any more than the son of a king has to pay the king tax. You with me? That's the logic here. I'm God's son. I don't need to pay the tax. So that's, that's one layer of the story in church. This is a multi-layered little story. You think it's just some cute story about, and you inspire to go fishing, maybe I can pay some taxes. There's a many layers to the story. One of it is this I'm God's son being reinforced. Another layer is the fact that so the answer is I don't need to pay this temple tax because I'm the son of the owner of the temple God. But he does pay it. He says in order to not cause offense, which is just strange. Jesus has been okay with offending the religious leadership up till now, right? He's been quite okay with that. But on this occasion, chooses not to. And that language of cause offense is going to come up a lot in his next big teaching in chapter 18, which we start next week. So we'll deal with that a little bit more then. But just note, he does pay it, even though he doesn't have to pay it. But he pays it through miraculous means, not from his own treasury account, but through getting Peter to go fishing, which leads us to the third layer of the story. 
where I do want to spend the, the little bit of time that we have left really getting into this third layer to the story. Because the question that really bugged me with the story, and in like outlining the series, I just like, man, there's something about the story, but I didn't know what, and I wanted to spend the whole sermon on it, but like, ah. But what really has still bugged me about the story is why does Matthew put the story here? We've learned so much that he's very deliberate in where he puts story, it could have gone anywhere. Why here? I mean, there's the Son of God link, but why directly after the prediction of his death? It's the second clear prediction of his death and resurrection, and Matthew puts this story right after that. Is there a connection in this fish story? <laughs> Something to do with the death of Jesus, and there is. But to get to that, we have to go to the origin story of this temple tax. So I told you everything about the temple tax, males over the age of 20. Where did I get that from? Well, it's just, it's, it's a commandment in Exodus chapter 30. So now if you're just reading through Matthew as an early Christian believer and you hear temple tax, you're like, oh yeah, I know what that is. That's from Exodus chapter 30. So we might not really, we might not make that link, but as I've mentioned before, often the Bible is like these hyperlinks. You know, like these, if you're reading an article and there's a little blue word, you click on it and boom, it takes you to another page. There's all these hyperlinks, especially in Matthew. So you're reading through temple text, you're gonna click on, okay, what is that? You're gonna come to Exodus 30. And Exodus 30 is that part, you know, Exodus is this amazing deliverance story. And then there's like, many, I think 15, 20 chapters of just the covenant that God is making, just laws and commandments. And chapters 25 to 30 are all commandments about the tabernacle, about the temple. And then right at the end is this little bit about the temple tax. Let's read that. Exodus 30. This is where the story in Matthew 17, just to keep your minds in focus, what's happening comes from here. So the Lord said to Moses, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 geras back then. Half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. Here's another little detail that I didn't give you. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than the half the shekel. Everyone gives the same. When you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement money, it's what God is calling it, when you take the atonement money from the people of Israel, shall give it to the service of the tent of meeting, so to keep the sanctuary, that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord, so as to make atonement for your lives. That's it. That's where this temple tax comes from. And you see it, you can read multiple stories in the Old Testament of when this was exactly done. This happened. Some of you might be thinking of David and his senses. That's absolutely in play here. But all, we all have time for. It's just, did you pick, did anything jump out at you from Exodus 30 about how this money, this temple tax slash census tax, about what, what it's called? Or what is, how does God refer to it? He describes it as, firstly, ransom money. Did you pick that up? Lord said to Moses, when you take this census, you shall each give a ransom for his life. The word ransom in Exodus 30 is the same word behind the word atonement. It's the same word. Three times in verse 15 to 16 was described as atonement money, to make atonement for your lives. That's very strange language to use for a tax, right? Like for money, atonement, ransom language, because it's language that echoes the sacrificial system. So Leviticus 17, I mean, we're not gonna go there, don't worry, but Leviticus 17 verse 11 speaks about sacrifices and the blood of animal sacrifices to make atonement for your souls, for it's the blood that makes atonement by the life. 
Atonement is a hugely important word for Christianity, probably one of our top three central words because we know it was the blood of Christ that atoned for our sins. The word atone just simply means to deliver or redeem by a substitute. So someone's a slave and they get delivered or redeemed by a substitute. And the essence of Christianity is that Christ was our substitute on the cross. It should have been us, but he was our substitute. And therefore by that sacrifice, we are set free from our sins. Amen, that's Christianity. And we know this was Jesus' purpose from the beginning was to, to, he will save his people from their sins. That's what his name means. But just bear with me, please hear this. Up till now, Matthew has not told us how Jesus will save his people from their sins. He has told us that he must die. So we know it's connected, but he hasn't told us how the death leads to saving people from their sins. He hasn't. I know you know, but if you're reading Matthew, he hasn't told us that yet. Where it will become a little more explicit is Matthew 20. A few weeks time, we'll read this. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So there's the word ransom. That story comes right before the events of Passion Week. So we know he will die, he'll give his life, and somehow it's gonna be a ransom, a substitute that will deliver people. And that's, that's now the word behind the temple tax, is that same language, the ransom, but in that story it's not blood, it's money. So here's my theory, church. Not just mine, but it's a theory. My theory is Matthew, being the tax guy, the finance guy, includes this story right after Jesus' second prediction of his death, knowing we would click the link to Exodus chapter 30 and therefore start to introduce us to the idea of ransom and atonement so that we start to think about how his upcoming death will achieve our deliverance from our sins. What do you think? Was that on Matthew's mind? No way to tell. One day we'll ask him. But Jesus' death as atonement is true. Amen? Substitute has been made so that we can be covered, so that we can be delivered, and it's made by Jesus, the Son of God, so that we are free. I mean, it's just interesting, the temple tax story. (laughs) Jesus pays it through miraculous means, and the end is so the sons are free. Whether that was on Matthew's mind or not, I think it was. But the atonement is true. The substitute has been paid by miraculous means. The son of God's death on the cross. The question we left with is, do you believe it? And I asked that question in the spirit of the first one Jesus asked. Faithless, twisted generation. How long am I to bear with you? How long am I to put up with you? The question is, is this an active, active realization and awareness. Maybe you're sitting out there today and you, you would be described as faithless and maybe today's the day. Through a crazy fish story, it becomes real in your life. This is how we delivered from our sins. Let's pray. Father, I do pray this morning, just thinking of this word faith and how we are confronted with these two aspects of faith, of being faithless and having little faith. And I do pray this morning for anybody who would be described as faithless as not having actively received deliverance through belief in your son Jesus Christ and his death and resurrection, that that faith would be activated. And I pray for the rest of us that that is a living reality. That we live in the assurance of our rescue and that in fact, how we live our lives 
is an indication of being set free from sin. And in that, we recognize how we are f- have little faith sometimes, where we don't actively experience the fullness of the power of the kingdom of God made available to us through faith in the Son, how we don't experience it, how we remain caught in our patterns of sin, how we remain ineffective in seeing darkness dispersed from not just our lives, but the lives of people around us and the mission fields you've called us to and recognize that so much is not done for your kingdom because we don't, we're not actively aware of the power available to us through faith in your son or because we try to do it on our own. And so we confess before you, we are people often of little faith in so many areas of our lives. It surfaces in our anxieties and it surfaces in our inabilities to be active forces for good, ambassadors of your kingdom in the world around us. So we we are, we are those disciples of little faith. I believe, help, our, help my unbelief. These are the words of the Father as recorded by Mark, and so we say those similar words. We believe, but not to the extent to which we should. Help our unbelief. And may that manifest in true powerful ways in our lives and the lives of people around us. We declare our active trust in Jesus the Son of God. Amen. Please will you stand so we can respond and worship together. There is a truth Older than the ages, there is a promise of things yet to come. There is one born for our salvation, Jesus. There is
speak to the sea. You stand in the fire, please tell me. You my Savior, there's power in your name, amen? And as we've been reflecting on today, it's, it's not power in your name as in like an incantation, a magic word. It's as in saying the name Jesus, we're connecting personally with him. There's power in Jesus. Uh, it's actually not my job to close the service today. Uh, Candice is our service host. Uh, we'll close the service, but the reason I'm up here uh, is to give you a quick announcement. So have a, have a seat just for a second. Uh, it, it relates to, so Candice, our service host for the day, uh, has been our services director here at RUC since 2021, so for three years, services director. If, if you've never known what that meant, it really means like boss of Sundays, make everything happen uh, on a Sunday and events around the week, and, and I'm sure you will all agree with me, has done a marvelous job with that. Uh, but she is, as of the beginning of April, not being our services director anymore. Uh, Candice is now technically working full-time with Red Frogs Ministry. You've heard a lot about Red Frogs through Candice, and so she's doing that work uh, full-time, supported by the Red Frogs Ministry, but also on the side, still employed by Rosebank to do a little bit of student ministry uh, here at Rosebank. So she's still around, and we're very grateful for that. Uh, and so I want to do, give you that news today, so come on up, Candice, so that we can give her a, a round of applause to thank her for marvelous work uh, as services director. She loves being in the spotlight and loves being acknowledged as being awesome. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make her as awkward as is possible, <laughs> as a good friend does. Uh, but I also wanted to just announce to you, so as Candice's replacement as services director is the most wonderful Shailen. So Shailen will come up and introduce you to Shailen. You have seen Shailen run. A round of applause as well. <laughs> Equally wonderful. We've come to see that. Shailen has been employed in our young adults ministry. Uh, and we'll still be doing Young Adults Ministry, but also our services director going forward uh, as well. So please pray for Shailen. Please be nice to Shailen. <laughs> I've said it. Please be nice to her. Um, but we are so grateful to have such talented, hardworking, and gifted people serving at Rosebank. So uh, another round of applause for them. So thank you. And as a welcome, and then hand over to Candice for closing the service. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Shay. So church, as I mentioned earlier in the service, that our worship, it doesn't stop here, but it continues after the service. And so I encourage you, grab a cup of coffee at Sesonke and enjoy fellowship with one another. Please go out and say hello to Christine, sign up for our newsletter, see how you can be supporting her. Um, and then if you are new here or you're wanting to get connected, please come and meet me at the welcome desk. I would love to meet you and help you get connected. Um, and for the end of the service, I'd like to read an epic benediction. That's fine. Um, and I'm reading, Now the Savior who died, who lives and reigns, grant you joy in labor, peace in troubles, hope in despair, and faithfulness in temptation. Amen. Thank you, church. Life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken. 
Free heart that is broken. 